Hello, hopefully we are streaming. I think so, it looks so. So I will stay here for a minute or so and let the room fill up as usual. Feel free to say hi. Um, and maybe tell me where you are in the world. That would be lovely too. Feel free to think of a name for my new friend. <laughs> Hello, Sai. Hello, Mark. In Germany, nice. Hello. You're on dry land. Would I assume you're somewhere else? So just doing our typical thing of just giving it a few minutes to let the room fill up as it were. Although I'm gonna start calling it to allow the class to fill up because I do, do still think of us as an academy in the sort of strictest sense of the word. 19 of us so far, hello everybody. Uh, who else is here? Samara, Wendy, Pam from British Columbia, Canada, nice. Sai so says he's in his bedroom and the name for my little, um, he's called a Jabba ball, should be Oogle, which I quite like. Hertfordshire, nice, Southern US, Jordan, Devon. I don't know how to pronounce that, Lisa. <laughs> Oh, we've got similar hairstyles, yes, yes. 22 of us, okay, so we're getting there, lovely. Um, so hello, lovely people. Um, you're gonna hear me repeat myself. Um, I'm Dr. Chloe Faraha, and you're gonna hear me repeat myself because today was a pre-record with a fantastic, um, aspiring young autistic advocate, um, Harry Cromar. So part of the beginning of the video is me explaining who I am and what Academy is. Um, so if you are new to Academy, we are an educative platform where anybody who's autistic with something that they can teach our learners of all backgrounds, um, we are interested in having them on. And no non-autistic people, um, I don't plan to anyway, and I don't plan to change my mind of having any non-autistic people coming and educating um, at this point in time. Um, also happy autistic acceptance and pride and embracing and supporting autistic people month. Um, we are considering as Academy doing a session um, as an ad added um, session to our normal Saturday sessions to have a discussion between Tigger so Tigger Pritchard, who will um, who joins me um, now as a co-presenter, and David Gray Hammond, who is also now joining Academy as a co-presenter. So we're thinking about having a, a, an extra session on autistic acceptance, autistic pride, and the importance of knowing the difference between awareness um, and things like acceptance. Yes, exactly. So somebody in the uh, comment section, Mark, saying, "What about?" Um, appreciation. Yes. And I think there are lots of better words than just awareness, but that's a whole other talk that um, David and Tigger and um, myself, we are thinking of doing. Um, so I think there's a lovely number of people here now. So I'm going to share my screen so you can see the fantastic video with Harry Cromar. I will be in the comment section, so you'll feel free to ask questions or make comments or just chat amongst yourselves um, and just use the space as you like. So let me just share my screen. You see my messy desktop. Uh, 
And that person that's asking is it's being recorded? Yes. So any video that we ever put out um, on Academy is always available after the fact. So you can find it under lives. It will also duplicate under videos on our page. Um, and you can also go to YouTube, our YouTube channel, if that's easier as well, because obviously all the videos are just collected together there. Um, so I do that um, in the week afterwards. So um, let's kick off with, like I say, Harry Cromar, Young Autistic Advocate. And what's particularly great about this is, is two things, is that his perspective on potentially how we can describe autistic experience to young people, which comes up as a question often, you know, how do we approach this in a good positive way um, or a balanced way for young autistic people? So Harry gives us um, some insight into that. And he also discusses really quite eloquently um, how he processes all sorts of things, um, but particularly how he managed when he was struggling um, and how to articulate that because he was really struggling to kind of pick apart the way his brain was working through the things that he was finding really difficult. So I think this has been a particularly good um, session that I did with this young person. So hopefully the sound works okay. I'm gonna open um, Facebook on my phone as well to check. And I'll be back at the end. Hello everyone, I am Dr Chloe Farahar of Orcademy, where Orcademy is an educative platform where autistic people and only autistic or otherwise neurodivergent people educate about autistic experience. And today I am joined by Harry Cromar, although I can see your Zoom says Lisa, <laughs> um, but this is Harry Cromar. Um, hi Harry. Who is being an amazing Bond villain with Dog Lucy, I love this. Oh, hey Lucy. Oh, does Lucy actually, Lucy? Oh yeah, look, cool, come to your name, you are so cute. Um, so Harry is here discussing um, being autistic as a young person, but also um, something quite interesting, which is Harry's roots of autism in terms of, well, I'll get you to explain it in a bit. And um, I have been introduced to Harry by, by his mum. So Lisa Cromar came on Academy a few weeks back um, discussing the uh, effectiveness of person-centred counselling, which is when she explained about you. Um, and that's why we're having a chat today. Okay. So it's the question we ask every guest, who are you and what is or are your specialisation? So what things are you interested in? So who are you? We'll do that one first. Uh, Harry Cromer. And how old are you? Uh, 15. 15. So how's school going? Very good. At the moment, I'm doing Monday, Mondays and Wednesdays and Thursdays in. And then hopefully on the 9th, um, everything goes back to normal and I'm in full days. And... Is that because of lockdown that you're doing mm -hmm. limited days? Okay, not necessarily because you're autistic. No, the because the rules of um, because I'm in Middlewich, that's too far away from the school. It's like if I lived right next to the school, I'd be in full time. But because I live in Middlewich, there has to be more restrictions to it. How are you finding that actually? Um, it's all right. It's not too bad with the restrictions. Do you like school? Is it good that you're not in as much or? I prefer being at school. Interesting. I hated school. <laughs> so that's interesting. So what, what do you particularly like about school? Um, adds things to do. Things to do. I guess the structure and the routine is quite nice. Mm. Yeah, I'd say that. Maybe, yeah. Okay. And so my other question then is what is or are your specialisations? So what kinds of things are you really interested in? Um, well, I think it was like, um, say learning probably and exercise. What kind of exercise? I have not done any exercise for ages. I really should. <laughs> Just general exercise really, like the so sport adrenaline or something or the excitement of it so obviously i know you're autistic so do you also have attention differences 
So sometimes people with ADHD really like exercise. So is it part of that? No, not really. It's just something that I like. The main thing with me would probably be like how my mind works. Is what, sorry, say that again? Probably like how my mind works mainly. Yeah, in terms of what, like in the exercise, it's kind of helps. Or yeah. that was your specialisation that you're interested in? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, another thing with exercise in my mind would probably be that it sort of clears my mind a bit. Like sort of puts like a direct um, attention towards something. Yeah. Because I've got, I've got problems of, I think, thinking attention, trying to think about specific things. Like everything's like, so on a, like, like imagine like a 3D box of information, sort of just lines and lines of information. It's sort of a, each line merges in and out. It's very difficult to think about specific things and specific topics. I like this 3D box. Is that how you imagine it or is that how you actually see things in your mind? So the reason I ask that is I'm very visual, so I see mm. lots of pictures when I'm thinking. See, the thing with me is that a lot of things that I come up with aren't like from thinking over a long time because that box idea, I just that's just something I pick. So imagine the sort of a pool, like a whirlpool for every single specific topic of things. So say for coming up with that box just then, I was thinking of ways to describe like the mind. And that's kind of, that's that's the same as the tree, um, the roots of the autistic mind problem that I made. Um just pick that out of a big pool of ideas that are, that are spinning in my mind. So that's what I did for that box just then. That's just a random thing that my brain just has. And that's what I do for the things. I just pick them out of the, the separate like little whirlpools and just use them to describe things like that. That's awesome because the amount of autistic people I meet and all my friends are autistic, and our brains are never quiet. So you're describing this whirlpool of, of thoughts and ideas and things. And I think that not in necessarily exactly the same visual way, mm. but I think all a large number of autistic people's brains work like that. So we find things like meditation and mindfulness really difficult. So mm. I don't know if you've tried mindfulness at all. Yeah, I've tried it. The, the main thing I do to concentrate on my thoughts is mainly just go in silence and sort of try and pick out different things do you know what process you do for that to be able to be clearer for you not really okay. i'm quite interested because i could see your brain you're obviously thinking something so when i asked that question what were you thinking or seeing that's the thing for me with questions that's also linked to everything because with questions i've got this i've got this kind of irritating for me type thing where i'm trying to where if i get an asked a question i just go my brain just goes through every single possible answer for that and like it's so the same even every word just fits into different sentences and you sort of just trying to take all of every word in the alphabet and trying to piece those into a sentence without it falling apart and having to grab the sentences back together again. That is really interesting because I should I should do better actually because I say this when I teach and train people about autistic experience that asking um, questions, particularly ones that people autistic people aren't prepared for, mm. my brain does that same thing. So if somebody in small talk with a non-autistic person, if they say to me, um, you know, how are you doing or something like that, my brain goes, OK, I've never met you before. So do you mean throughout my whole life? 
do you mean this last year? Do you mean this last week? Do you mean today? If I tell you about today, okay, do I need to tell you that I couldn't find any eggs this morning for my breakfast that I've been eating for six months? And that was really stressful. You know, which bit do you need? Mm. My brain goes, all of these things are possible pieces of information you need to know. Yeah, I, I, get, I get that feeling a lot. <laughs> okay, right. So this is a very good educative point for people who are listening, which is we really struggle with those sorts of questions because there's all possible types of answers. And very interesting what you said about focusing on particular words. Hmm. So you're kind of picking apart the question as well at really individual word level. Is that right? Hmm. Yeah. Okay, because... Yeah. We've got Rachel Cullen, who's going to come on. Um, we've got a recording with um, her where she discusses how autistic people, compared to non-autistic people, how our brains work linguistically, so how we pick apart the words very differently. Mm -hmm. um, so we tend to ask this question of everybody, but this might be slightly different for you. So when were you discovered as an autistic person? So when did you um, discover you were autistic? Mm -hmm. I forgot that one. I didn't really pay attention to it because I think that was just something that popped up that my mum found out. Um, when did your uh, mum find out about you being autistic then? Yeah. And what, what age were you? Do you know? <laughs> Ten. Ten, about. okay. So about five years ago, okay. Um. So how did your family explain being autistic to you? Uh, I forgot. I think it was just a thing that we um, found out. Now uh, I'm thinking about my mum, the fact that she's just right round the corner, just stood <laughs> in the kitchen doing nothing. So, I mean, how do you understand being autistic then? So if you can't remember your family explaining it to you, um, how do you understand your that what being autistic means? I guess. Um, I guess my my answer, the main answer that I've got that I'm going for for that, I think it also requires people who hear my answer to understand in their minds what exactly I'm sort of getting at, and I'd say my answer for that is another thing that I was actually talking about along with the roots thing that I just came across um, is sort of on a railway track best describes it as just a straight line and being autistic sort of takes you out so neurotypical and um, neurodiverse we're neurodiverse which is autistic so being autistic means that you're sort of not going on the train you're more walking down a pathway along the railway that's sort of going out into wherever you want it sort of a, means that you're able to be free in mind almost sort of go across everything that you wouldn't normally be able to go across if you did not have autism that's interesting and because i'm very visual i'm literally seeing the train track and the train and you walking next to it on a path yeah that's what i sort of went for for it that, that that's what i find to be one of the best ways to describe it to people is actually even if someone's not like a heavily visualizing person the best way to get them to see that is actually to get them to visualize it because visualizing something sort of just sets it there in your mind and and it also the thing is so imagine like your mind's eye that's sort of looking at all of the information in your brain and if you visualize something that sort of makes it a pinpoint so you can visual so you can see that better and you are clearly quite similar to myself in very very visual because i can see you do what i do which is when you're talking and thinking you look up and you're seeing the pictures yeah yeah, I can see that because I do that too. So when you were saying about the train, I looked at my wall because I was like, right, train, track. Mm. Oh, look, there's Harry walking along the path next to the train, right? Yeah. Um, but what's really interesting, which I will actually try and see if I can come back to that, 
which is that there is a number of autistic people who have aphantasia, which means they can't think in pictures. And I have no idea how their brain works because how does that happen if they're not thinking in pictures? Um, so they really would struggle with that sort of mind's eye imagination technique. So I would be interested in thinking in the future about how your roots of the autistic mind might support people who can't think in pictures. They might do better if they can see it drawn, potentially. Mm -hmm. But I think I'd need to find out from um, autistic people that I know that don't think in pictures how that, that might work for them. Okay, yeah. so that's... Oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, that's the thing, because it, it, it's a difficult thing to work with is autism because there's the amount of different ways that the mind works you have to like you could go like the roots thing that i made that can of course that goes to a visualization point but it's not going to work for everyone which is why like it's difficult because you because every single person has their own visualization or different way of looking at things and it's well it's pretty much impossible to actually get that down to a science because because it doesn't matter what amount of things you come up with there's always going to be someone else that doesn't get it and there's something else that and also some things you can't get help with you have to sort of look at the help that people give you and then you have to figure that out by yourself but i think coming up with things like your roots of the autistic mind will help the people who can use it yeah. who maybe wouldn't have had that idea or come across that themselves mm. so i think you're quite right i think having multiple ways of understanding the autistic mind and supporting the different types of autistic people because we're very variable um, and very varied as a, a community mm. can only strengthen supporting us because you've got all those different ways of doing it mm. okay so that was your how you understand being autistic i'm still quite interested in the train tracks analogy so can you explain a bit about what that means then if you're the autistic person you said the end the neurotypical people are, are the train or on the train on the train and then the autistic person like yourself is walking along the path mm. so what what does that mean what is the difference then so if you look at that and that what i like what, what one of the things i actually um really like doing with that is um i come up with a visualization of it so like the train track and then the pathway for two different um things and then i like like picking apart the details of what actually is happening in that situation so in the train on the in actually going in train means that you're going like a straight line like following the code of like life or something and not really setting your mind apart from that so like neurotypical in like that um situation they're just following the pattern that is given to them and not actually taking the mind away from that to be different and being um autistic and going along the pathway you can go in any direction whatsoever and sort of just be free pretty much so you feel that being autistic means more free? You kept using the word free. Mm. And in what ways? Obviously, like you said, it means you can go off on different paths um, away from that very particular way for neurotypical people. No, I try to describe it for as a, like on a as a base for everyone else, but just the way I describe that is because personally, for me, that's is sort of free from society sort of not following the same lines as everyone else is actually like i guess you could describe it as being yourself instead of being what society um because when i actually made this idea it was because i was i was looking at the way society works to try and help my mum because one of the questions she asked me, I think I remember, was um, talking about some other people in society 
and sort of the situations affect people. So we were talking about social standing and how that affects most people. You know, sometimes that ends up with them sort of going into counselling. That's like a big situation. And I sort of looked at the railway and the pathway as going along the pathway allows you to be free from that. Um, pretty much, like the first thing I came up with was another thing, and sheep and goat. So the sheep are like grazing on like the grass on a platform um, of ground, and then it's sort of. I mean, they keep on grazing the same grass. They don't try and climb up the mountain to find the other side of that. And um, I described it as back then, and in the way I describe it now would be those are neurotypical. The goats are so sort of the goat that goes up the mountain to find new grass. That's autism. You sort of go past everything and try and find new heights um, and try and get to places that people don't usually try and get to. That's a, a fantastic way of looking at it. I really like that. And because I think I say my brain works slight in a similar way to you, I think I saw the goats and they're going up the path and whatnot and going up to the, um, up the mountain. But I also have somebody I support who really loves goats. And then I could see, you know, have you ever seen the, the um the the dam where it's got those and it's like the dam is like a wall and you've got the goats that are like standing propped oh, yeah so that's the thing my brain goes off and I could see all that but that was a really interesting lovely way of describing with the autistic experience um so there's quite an interesting perspective and quite a positive perspective that you have about autistic experience does that is that all from yourself is it from your family making you also feel positive and supported about being autistic I think it's mainly myself when I actually look at it like um, on my own scale which is great because the reason we we, we were asking a, a number of young people how to explain being autistic to another young person mm. is because sadly some people will um, feel quite negative or they'll receive negative mm. information so your way of describing it is a really interesting positive way um so i think that'd be really useful for a lot of people to help explain it maybe to their children or their young people their teenagers and what have you yeah um, when when you said um a negative thing that sort of made me come up with an idea just then of hearing negative things about autism I don't know I think that would I think there's something that happens in the mind that's sort of a like sub subconscious thing that links to the way that everything works sort of adds sort of a just th something that clicks and that goes into like conscious behavior so if you hear something bad about autism, that sort of sets your mind into like a mood of how to feel about that. That's sort of separate from the subconscious. That's not really visual. Like even in your mind, eye isn't really visual. It's something that happens and can only really be seen if you actually look at it properly on a level. And so is that is that a way of you trying to explain that if people use quite negative ways of discussing autism, the person's going to take that on mm. in the unconscious. Is that is that kind of what you mean? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And, and that for me, because um, my background is stigma. And so, yes, if we hear negative all the time, if you hear it in society, in the media and things like that, the person it's describing or the group of people it's describing, we take that on and it really affects us negatively. So that's why I'm really loving and interested in your really lovely in positive way of explaining autistic experience. Yeah. I think it'll be really useful for parents to explain to their children. Um, so that's really good. So, so you really, well, you were discovered as autistic at 10. Um, 
Did you at any point feel or recognise that you were different to other children who weren't autistic? I think, well, when I was 10, didn't really have the... Like, there, there's sort of a certain point where you have to have enough um, conscious power to see into your sub into your subconscious and at 10 I didn't really have that it's been the past probably the past two years that I've been um, able to sort of look into my subconscious and understand that better and so did you ever feel that you were different to other people mm -hmm. probably but you've not really investigated that no, not really. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> because I was, I mean, in comparison to you, I didn't discover I was autistic till I was 32. Um, and I'd already all that time felt very different to other people who weren't autistic, for instance, and things like that. So if you've not recognised or been made to feel different, um, because sometimes that can feel negative, um, and I don't want you to have to feel negative because you've got this quite positive way of understanding yourself so we're going to skip over that then um don't ever don't ever worry about that um so then my next question is um what sensory needs do you have because all autistic people have their own sensory profile probably that's what goes to different situations for me i say if i'm in a situation where i need to think then quiet and dark just it would be the best environment for me and do you have any so you i've been sitting here with this little thing um because it feels good for me to be able to regulate my how i feel and those kinds of things are you do you fidget with things do you have objects or anything like that Sometimes objects. The main thing I need to do is just nails. And yeah, so so I I have um I have one that I do that's like this, like the patterns. So you've can you do that again? Can I just see what you do? I'm like clicking my nails to the thumbs together. Nice. And what does when does that tend to happen for you? When do you do that? Um, it's just a thing I do. I guess. I think. Um, I think it's for me, it sort of um, adds sort of a beat to, to the thing. It's, it almost sets the information on point in my brain. So instead of going like crazy, it's sort of just like whilst it's going crazy, it's just like beep in place and just sort of distracts um, the chaos and sort of lets me concentrate a bit on the situation. So that's interesting because that sounds like grounding. So I don't know if your mum's discussed that with you because obviously with her counselling background. But yeah, it sounds like grounding, like you're um, focusing on something to try and focus those thoughts. Is it something as well about the noise? Because you, I could hear you've got a little, there's like the clicking of the thumbnails. Yeah, I think so. I think it's sort of, it's a noise that's just, it's a very distracting noise which helps. And what about school? So do you have any things you need to do to regulate when you're at school? Do you do that as well or other things? Pretty much. I mean, school is like, school's all right. It's a pretty nice environment in the room we're in. It's a big room. So, I mean, of course, it can get distracting at some at times, so the, the room. Like, um... Yesterday, I was trying to get uh, on with maths work, and sometimes my brain goes a bit um, too crazy with things and gets distracted, and I need to have some quiet time to correct it in place. And I can't really just... And it takes time for me to do that, which in my old school, um, the old high school I went to... Um, um, there was like a sensory room. I had to go to that for quiet. And with me getting my mind back on play is, is um, sort of a process I have to go through. It's like um, like a loading time. Have you seen on some like games the sort of a loading um, thing? 
for updates or something, it's sort of re reload basically and distractions from other people is sort of a reset button that is constantly back to zero. Do you get that opportunity to do that? So do, are you in a mainstream school? Oh no. No. Uh, have you seen um, Adelaide Heath? Yeah, it's um, I don't know what to call it. Type of school. Um, so your classes they tend to be quite small in terms of the numbers of students. Yeah, yeah there's only about um, five of us most of the time. And so are they quite good then? So when you need that reset time and the loading processing bar, as it were, that's what I'm imagining in my head. Mm -hmm. um, do they allow you to do that? Do you have a way of um, just do it by myself. Uh, I've gotten, I've definitely gotten better at keeping my mind on focus. That's one of the main things I try and do. I like to just, whenever I'm doing something that's not work, I'm always thinking and always trying to find new things to think about. And one of the main things I've been doing recently is just trying to search for different um ways to sort my brain out so apart from work and school life then so what kind of things do you do um at home is not much it's just exercise and thinking yeah mm. you are a big thinker i can tell you can hear this from from all the questions and things there's mm. lots and lots of thinking do you write any of this thinking and ideas down or draw or no not really no just trying to think okay because if i find something that i'm gonna use in my mind for a really long time that just sticks there in my mind as sort of a um, sort of a pin, like a center point of the, like a point of interest in the mind that's just like put a pin in it. You can come back to it, have a look at it, yeah. investigate it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much, um, if you watch much telly then so have you seen um the british sherlock holmes series with benedict cumberbatch so you know like the mind palace do you remember that those episodes so it's where sherlock holmes does it but also um one of the villains and everything is like um a palace or a library in the brain and they literally close their eyes and sort of walk through it to pick up ideas or books and things like this um, and to some extent, your brain, the way it processes, sounds quite similar, that you can hold on to those and come back to it and revisit it. Yeah, that is, um, that, that's kind of like what I do sometimes. I have tried um, doing the library thing, walking through a, a library. It's a difficult thing to for me to do with that, though, because... Because uh, I try and keep like a way of thinking like in my mind that's difficult for me to do sometimes though well you seem to have your own way of doing it so you don't mm. have to change it to be a library or something but it mm. seems like you do that kind of naturally that you've all, all, almost taught yourself to do that as well yeah. so the big question you came up with so is it the roots of autism or the roots of the autistic mind uh, either either so you came up with this idea, this method, and you wrote about it with your mum. Mm -hmm. um, so can you explain what it is? Um, how so? Which, um... So I guess, how did it come about then? Let's start with that question. So how did the roots of autism come about? It's random talking. Random talking. That's how we get everything done. Uh, it, that's... It, my favourite thing to do is just random talking, trying to find um, things to talk about. Awesome. So could you explain, because obviously remembering this is going to be for our learners, so what is the Roots of Autism? What does it do or what is the purpose of it? Um, I said a bit about it before. I mean, it's a way of um, 
looking at the, the way that it's um, supposed to help with counselling um, is basically to unravel like issues that have gone on or problems that might be like afflicting people and sort of um, help like sort of help um, them sort of keep their mind like focused or deal with um, problems that might be coming from stress or any bad emotions felt towards situations and sort of um, basically so the roots um, you draw the roots going downwards and with the roots you draw every sort of situation that's happened in your life that is affecting the situations of why you're going to counseling that's what it will do in counseling so write down um say so for me it would have been from writing down like what happened in primary school to high school and what things happened in between then to cause problems to cause things to be good as well and sort of connect which situations through the root system of them um, how things intertwine with each other and um, how things go and what it's supposed to do in counseling is help you to untangle the bad roots and sort of help the tree grow it's almost a constricted roots you sort of have to unconstrict um, or deconstrict whatever the word is um to help the tree grow upwards and what it will be for counseling is sort of over time as you're deconstructing um or deconstricting um, roots it's helping the tree grow so you draw the roots oh, those roots are bad they're gone get the tree to grow higher and i guess at the end of the counseling thing you would do sort of actually finish it off if it's sort of going along the counseling thing for an art type style of it you'd um, as you're drawing the tree going upwards you end up finishing the tree and sort of making your own little scene and i guess like a sentimental thing afterwards would be to like keep that as I fixed it, or whatever the motive. Would Frame be. it and put it on your wall and say, "This is how far I've come." Yeah. yeah. Is it fair to say that the tree is kind of the whole person and sort of yeah that progress and moving forward, and the roots of the tree that in some cases are all tangled and things because of the different things interact uh, interacting with one another. Is that the unconscious mind trying to deal with things? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Is that fair? <laughs> it's your idea. You you can correct me. <laughs> yeah. Um what I'll do as well is um I'll link the I think there is a paper or there's going to be a paper. Is that right with you and your mum discussing the, mm -hmm. the roots of autism? So I'll link the paper and if I've got permission from both of you, I'll just do like a little screenshot as well of what one of your drawings, if that's okay. So yeah, that's right. got Particularly for those who can't think in pictures, they might like to see what it looks like. Yeah. Um, so I've got a, a note here as well, because obviously, like I said, I've spoke to your mum um, when we did a live before and she mentioned about this. Um, and so for you, why did that come about as well? So I've got a note here about being bullied, if that's OK to discuss that. Yeah. So what came about with creating the roots of autism? Mm. I mean, with the with bullying, that was just I don't know why people were uh, bullied. Of course, that would have to link to what happened to them to start bullying in the first place. I don't know much about them because bullies don't really talk. I mean, it's very difficult to be friends with a bully because they're not really open about their emotions. I have managed to be friends with a couple of bullies and sort of kind of help them with um, things, I can't say names, I would, uh, I'd say names if I was allowed to. Yeah. Just someone in um, last high school I was in, 
um, they had a very bad influence friend, which led them down a very, not very good path for them. Uh, but they did get past them when they figured out that their friend was horrible. Um, um, so basically, um, the, their friend wasn't really a friend, it was like a, um, a snake, basically. I mean, I know how to describe them. Um, like, just placing false information, making rumours about everyone, sort of taking advantage of people um, that didn't have the capability of... Um, seeing people for who they actually were so that um they did get past them eventually though which was good and so i was able to be friends with them sort of understand what had happened which was good to see do you know what's really interesting about that is a couple of things that is an incredibly generous and very mature way of looking at the bullies mm. and I'm really pleased that you didn't say I was bully bullied because of something relating to you mm. because nobody is bullied because of something relating to them and their differences they're bullied because the person's a bully and there's something like you say um that that, that they have issues kind of thing yeah. because I support a lot of adults who will say I was bullied because I X, Y, Z, I was different. I was this, I was yeah. that. And I have to say to them, that's not what happened. You were bullied because they were bullies, not because of something that's wrong with you. So that is a really mature and actually quite interesting way that you're looking at it mm. and not taking it on board as that it was an issue with you because it would never be an issue from your perspective. Yeah. But you've gone even that step further and you've been really generous in actually trying to understand and even befriend bullies, which I don't think is very easy for a lot of people, adults or young people. Yeah. And I don't necessarily think everyone should. Nobody has to try to be friends with their bullies, though. But I think it's really interesting and generous and quite mature that you've mm -hmm. done that. Because I try and when I when I look at people, I don't look at any of the bad parts of that. I try and figure out how to be friends with them. Someone at um, my new high school, they've got a bit of um, so uh, I don't know what um, you could call it really. Um, it's sort of a I don't know, um, they, they've sort of got a, not anger, but, um, I don't know how to describe it, it's, um, Maybe they're frustrated and it comes out as, in a particular way? Sort of, um, a, they're very specific the way that their mood is, and I, I don't show frustration towards them. I go because well, I basically I go along with who people are, not really what's wrong with anything. I don't see there being anything wrong with someone being who they are, no matter how bad they are or something. I try and see past everything to try and get along with them better. Which allows me to get along with people pretty well. Because I can sort of go along the lines of what they understand and how they are friends with people to be friends with them. I'm able to sort of put on um, sort of the way of thinking about things to better understand them. So some really in-depth perspective taking. Mm. with other people yeah which is really really important as well 
to debunk as a myth because autistic people are arguably we um, really struggle with perspective taking of others but I think it's just as variable in the autistic community mm. as it is in the non-autistic community and you're demonstrating that actually um, you do it it seems very very well mm -hmm. so in terms back to the roots of autism so as I understand it, was it a means for you to understand something you were struggling with or things that multiple things that you were struggling with? Back music. <laughs> I was bringing the <sighs> Um sort of. It was a uh, cause Mm -hmm. is it if i prompt if i don't distract you from too much from your thought process um is it the case that you had uh quite bad back problems for a yeah, long time do that it wasn't really a way of getting over that i don't think it was sort of something that came along with it did help with a lot of things the main thing that it helped with i think was just sort of getting me into the counseling myself mindset um, was able to get rid of my music problem, which was the biggest thing ever for me. So what was the music problem? I don't know. It just sort of came out as a, like I said before, a mood of looking at things. Something happened in my mind that set like a tone for that. The problem was I didn't remember what it was, so I couldn't solve it until then. So I was able, I had to... That was why it was so difficult for me to get over it, I think, was because I couldn't look at the the source of where it had come from to understand where it came from. So I had to find a way to get rid of it by setting a completely different mood. And like I said, with the sub subconscious is something that's not really solved by the subconscious. So I had to find a way to do that, which was really difficult. Can I ask, so what was the problem with music? What what issue did you have or what? how was it affecting you? Because it was like a sub subconscious like mood of it. I just could not emotionally cope with music. Like it was just an immediate tone of bad mood whenever I heard music. For rock music, it was fine though for some reason. I think that connected because along the same lines, um, remember Guitar Hero? Yeah, that was, I had good memories of that. So that set a tone that went above whatever happened that linked to all other music. So, so that sort of pushed past whatever I went through and made it out. And so how did your roots of autism did it help you with the issue with music? Are you able to listen to music now? Yeah, I'm fine with music now. It was something that was a problem. And like I did with like your unraveling roots, that's how effective it actually is. If you get the, the roots of the autistic mind and, um, theory in your mind and actually use it for something, for me, I mean, my music problem, I actually have experience from that to say that it works um, if you actually get it to click. Because I, I was able to somehow just get that root of music down in my mind. Um, and I was a, once I was able to get it down, I was immediately able to just cut it and get it over and just completely fix it. Is there any way you can describe how that how you did that so is it the case that you drew all the different roots one of the roots had music on it and you like is it you pulled them apart what what was um intertwined the way that it was for me was just the memory part of it like if i actually had memory of why it happened in the first place i would have gotten rid of it a long time ago but i just went completely memory blank of why it happened and what about my, the thing started the problem of music in the first place for me so the moment i was get 
I was able to, I, I don't even know what memory of it I was able to get back, but I think I was able to get the situation that it happened back as a memory. So I was able to get that route down and that was all I needed. I just needed a link to the memory of that to get rid of it completely. Interesting. Sounds good. And in and my my next comment is how do you think your roots of autism might help other autistic young people? Hmm. I guess what it will do to help people if it's understood by them is for them to see what exactly um what problems they they have come across in their mind. And if they're able to see that, they're able to do the same thing I did, I guess, is find the problem and get it pinpointed so that they're actually able to know exactly what the problem is and find a way to deal with it instead of it sort of dodging the the mind eyesight. So imagine it's like you, you've got your mind eye, you're looking at all the information, and that little piece of information that's causing the problem is sort of darting away, avoiding sort of the beam of gaze, almost. That makes sense. That's really... I quite like that. I can imagine it as well, like you say. So it's that it's um, it's a repressed something. And so, like you say, you're describing it as it's darting around so you can't focus on it. So you're feeling that it's almost like confronting that problem head on grabbing it looking at it mm. kind of thing that's great um so i'm nearly to the end of my questions this is quite brief i think but when your mum was on discussing person-centered counseling for autistic people she mentioned you are wanting to be an autistic self-advocate um so my question is what would you like to do and achieve as an advocate I guess I'd like to help everyone else sort of get the way I think out there and sort of try and use that to everyone else's advantage to try and help people come across, help people get over their own problems by, and, and for me, I'll be able to try and get everything in my mind sort of put it out there um, so that it can be seen and maybe use it to help people that need it because I don't need it because I mean I'm completely open my mind is just an open book the pages are everywhere so I don't need to use any of it but loads of other people do and that's what I want to be able to do is to actually get it out there for people and I think you have some great insight into things so some of the things that you've said to in this session I think are going to be really useful for young people and parents and and you know teachers and what have you trying to support those young people even just you being able to describe how your brain works will help people who aren't autistic understand how an autistic brain might work given that yeah. we're very varied as a community yeah that's yeah. also one of the other things that i um wanted to do from experience is because i've seen the way the um, neurotypical people think and uh, um i want to try and get them to understand how to look at people properly instead of um, having a fixed mindset towards people. And I think I can see that you will be very, very good at that and very strong at being able to do that. Your way of um, explaining things is really quite useful and quite open, like you say, that I think it will help people understand. So this is, um, yeah, I can see um, a great future for you as a self-advocate and academy will be very very happy to support you to do that um so we can talk about that in the future um so i've got two last questions that are just like little ones to finish us off mm -hmm. do you have any words of wisdom for young autistic people that's my first one mm -hmm. what would you say with the be specific for that 
Um, words of wisdom. What do you think might be the most important thing for a young person who's just realised they're autistic to know? Do you think there's a key piece of thing, information you might want them to know to make them feel positive about being autistic, maybe? Hmm. From the look at it, not as a bad thing or a different... Cause I think something that also might happen is when someone hears that they're autistic, sometimes that sort of adds, like, the fact that they have to be told almost sort of almost sets a standard in their mind that, hmm, I have to be told this. Why did I have to be told this? Is this a bad thing? Is this a good thing? And sometimes if they're not told it's a good thing, it's sort of seen as a informing, like, they have to know this to almost watch out for it. And that's sort of what happens in the mind. So they don't realise that it's actually a good thing. Their mind sees it as a bad thing or almost something that needs to be looked out for almost. And that can sometimes go along a bad line than thinking for them, I guess. And I, words for people would be that it, it, it is a good thing. It's, it, it sort of sets you apart from the crowd. So you can be different from other people. And one of the main things is... Um, the, one of the main things for people that find out a little bit too late is that they've got the mindset of being cool and that is a very big i personally think that is a really big problem in society is when people are even in the slightest told to be cool because that social standing is something that even if you're not informed it's something that is always there naturally in the human mind and that's something that needs to be watched out for when people are children, especially, is social standing goes to a much higher level than people actually are um, conscious about when they're actually talking to people or doing things. Like, when a kid's being raised... And what I've seen um, is actually with things like football, like groups of people go towards football and that sort of sets um, a way of thinking about things for young um, children and that sort of carries on and sometimes that is not a good thing because that goes towards social standing. So like, the way that things escalate with that goes on to cause more problems. Do you mean like that group mentality of people joining or, or being um, supporting a football team. Is that what you mean? So like that group mentality can be a problem. Yeah, I guess. Because uh, I guess like all of that is a high detail description. And if you sort of zoom out on bases, that sort of uh, like, like using um. Um, like you're using a telescope, you're almost zooming out and trying to uh, and looking at the base of it, like the base um, what of what it is, and that could be social standing and then cool. But e even the word, you can sort of just look at how in depth that goes into. Uh, um, what effects it actually has and social standing is one of the side effects and the problems just link towards everything so basically the advice is we shouldn't be trying to be cool not really that i mean another thing with it is that it if you try and solve problems and like that's the prob that's another problem is that whenever you look at a problem with people and you see if you would see cool the main thing that 
I guess adults do to solve problems for people is they go, oh, just get rid of that completely. And that just isn't good because that leaves just an open gap. It's like, it's like your mind is there. That's just a part of it. And it's like giving a sledgehammer to it. Like that gets rid of that, but that can cause problems just going straight to everything else. When it should not be gotten rid of, it should be accepted, but refined almost. Sort of, you look at what it is in detail, but also you like keep it where it is, but you need it needs to be explained so that people understand almost what happens so that the problems that occur with it, like social standing, don't occur. Like, things need to be in higher detail for people. Otherwise, the mind takes it to levels that aren't good. Okay, so I feel like you said we need to be teaching the people around, say, an autistic person to have empathy for difference acceptance Mm. of difference it sounds like so teaching people around that person acceptance of difference and almost as well that if people are having a a tough time supporting them so that they're not how did you describe it throwing that bad onto that person that's different Mm -hmm. I think that's really key and interesting um, which is about basically changing people's perspectives of difference Mm. I think that's a perfectly good thing to end on as a point so Mm. thank you so so much Harry Um, very very useful and I'm sure we will have lots of lovely comments when we actually do this um, Mm. and send this out on Academy so thank you everyone for listening Um, I have been here with Harry Cromar discussing the roots of autism Um, I am Dr Chloe Farahar of Academy. So, yes, I do the cluster of points at the end. Um, Yes, when it comes to, um, because I'm I'm used to teaching, um, and so it's always a good idea to try and round up the key things that perhaps um, that person or whatever it was we were talking about or teaching about. Um, But yes, how amazing is that young autistic person? Um, And it was, it was a fascinating discussion to have with, yeah, I am still here, um, to have with him um, and just the way that he's able to articulate his his brain and how he processes um, is, as I've seen from comments in um, the comment section, something that even us as, you know, adult autistics still are getting our heads around about how we process. I think some of it um, is uh, probably linked to his mum. Um, so Lisa Cromar, I did link the video to um, her live that we did. So she discussed whether person-centered therapy, which is a, a, a mode of talking therapy, is it effective for autistic people, um, autistic herself, otherwise she wouldn't have been on Academy. And so I think, I think she's had some um, hand in the amazingness as well of her uh, lovely teenage boy, um, Harry. So yeah, so thank you so much. There've been some great comments in the comment section. Um, we are hoping to basically um, sort of keep Harry Cromar under our wing at Academy. He really wants to be an advocate. And I think it's really important, particularly if they are under 18, to make sure that they are safe. So we are hoping to do more things with him. So I did pin a comment. So if people are interested, you know, what other things might you want to hear from young people uh, and potentially specifically from Harry if we're to have him do more uh, videos for us, which I, we, we very much are hoping to do. Um, and he's very interested to I think he enjoyed doing that session. Um, so, yes, yeah, so if you've got any ideas about things that you want to learn from young people. Um, then yeah, let us know for Academy. So in terms of wrapping up. Um, 
So next week we have on uh, Dr. Monique Botha and her work is, is fantastic and it's, it's really interesting for me because my background is stigma and stigma reduction and particularly I'm much more interested in reducing that internal stigma that we can end up with um, by belonging to a stigmatised identity such as autistic and so it's really going to be great to hear from Monique I spoke I, I was on a panel with her the other day and it was great we had a chat afterwards and we just ended up talking about autistic stimmy things and it was just a lovely conversation so she's going to be on um, discussing minority stress autism mental health autistic community connectedness and stigma and they all I know that sounds like a lot but they all link into one another um so she kind of I guess talks as well a bit um in a similar way to a lot of what I talk about which is the the need for autistic identity positive autistic identity like Harry Cromar has you know been able to emulate that positive actually quite balanced I think not just positive because sometimes that can go um in the wrong direction as in we start thinking of autistic people as superheroes or having superpowers and I don't think that that's really realistic or healthy either so having that much more realistic understanding of having a positive autistic identity connecting to an autistic culture and our community and creating those autistic spaces spaces sorry and when we say space we mean it being autistic led, autistic friendly and having certain um, characteristics, not necessarily just a physical space, which I think a lot of people misunderstand when I'm talking about the importance of autistic space. So that's next week and that will be um, a live session. So um, Monique's gonna do a part presentation and then half an hour where we can just have a conversation. And so people have got any comments or questions in the comment section, that'd be great. Um, so thank you everybody so much for coming. Um, I don't think I've missed any key comments towards the end. I think everyone's just said some um, just lovely comments about Harry. Um, yeah, so just some lovely, lovely comments about, about his talk that was just on. Uh, yes. Absolutely lovely. Um, thank you everybody so much for coming. So this has been Academy. Um, this is Steve. Um, I can't remember, Oogle, did you decide Cy, but this is called Oogle. Okay, just warning you in case you have sensory sensitivities, he makes a noise, are you ready? <laughs> Which I love, it's just fantastic. Um, so everybody, thank you so much. I'm going to go and have my dinner. See you next week.